right. Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm so glad to, to have everybody in. And today we got a special guest. This is Dave Simeon. I've, I've had the pleasure of knowing Dave. I, gosh, it's probably before you know the world came about because he's been around in North Texas soccer for forever. And so, you know, I've gone to Clay's, got my B license under him, and and just really just an unbelievable amount of wealth and knowledge this man brings to the game. And not only that, but the the mentorship that he provided, not only myself, but many other coaches. And so when I got the opportunity to bring him on board for you guys, this is the unbelievably best thing I could think. And I'm so excited. And what he's actually going to talk about today is something that's dear to my heart and something that's really been a change from the early days of coaching. Correct me if I'm wrong, coach. But, uh, you know, the, the, the player development through play. And so with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to you. And like I said, thank you so much for joining this morning. Well, it's a real pleasure. Thanks so much, Warren, for the opportunity. And, uh, is there a way that I can see who is on the call with us? I'll tell you what, I will bring them all in, into the- Bring them all in, son. Okay. Here they come. All right, let's see who we have here. Oh, you're hitting those keys like nobody's business. Hey, what? Sometimes little old man fingers work okay. <laughs> Fred Kaiser's on. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I, I debated whether or not we were going to bring him on or not, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great stuff. Yeah, so everybody but Fred. I'm just kidding. Sorry, Fred. Hey, he couldn't resist. I need to mute him so he can't fight back. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, see, that's the only way you got to control him a little bit. You know, you got to put the. Leash really? on him. That's like a choke chain. You know, it's like one of those bad ones you look at in the <laughs> store. That's, that's great. It's got the that's, little prongs on it. <laughs> what's What's most funny about that is you go, no, it's not like a leash with Fred. It's like a choke chain. I'm like, <laughs> boy, that's that's kind of harsh, Fred. I feel bad for you having to put up with that, sir. Oh no, he's got it. <laughs> he's got oh, it. Okay. he's got it. Okay, <laughs> nice work. Okay, enough said. That's all we need to know there. Oh, that's great stuff. Well, good morning, everyone. I um, want to thank Warren for uh, the opportunity to uh, spend a little bit of time with all of you. And uh, the one thing everyone has um, a common interest in is the game. Uh, players. How do we train the players? How do we pick the players? How do we put them in positions where they're successful? How do we evaluate the players? How? So it's, it's, it's a huge interest coaches have at all levels of um, and that we share an interest in the game, that we share an interest in players, and that we also share an interest in how do I do this better? How do I, through some means or way, uh, listening, watching, uh, reflecting, uh, how do I get a little bit better at this? Um, and coaches in every environment, regardless of whether they're national coaches or uh, they are college coaches, which of course high school coaches have the most in common with. And I'll get into that a little bit when we talk about um, what those commonalities are. Um, but coaches at every level, the youth coach, that's just the mom or dad that doesn't have a lot of soccer background, they get a little information, they get a little bit of experience, and then they're wondering how, why, um, um, how does this, how do I make this a little bit better? So it's, it's, it's a big central issue uh, that we self-evaluate, that we are curious. I think that's another big part of it from just a, an education perspective. So one of the things that occurred to me years ago, um, probably in 1988 or 89, when I was hired as 
the state director of coaching in South Texas. Um, and so when I see coaches on here from the Rio Grande Valley or El Paso, spent a lot of time in both of those locales with the club guys and um, with the high school coaches to pull players out of there. We got players out of those areas. Um, but one of the things that occurred to me in putting together our, our ideas about training players, and I developed it as a tagline uh, when I was writing either for uh, National Soccer Coaches Association or the State Association or U.S. Soccer, I did my tagline with my tagline. And remember, play is the key word in player development. And it just kind of happened, but I was like, wow, that's, it, it kind of distilled things down so that um, is an important part of player development. Um, and I, I, I went a little bit deeper than that because I was very, very interested in educators, educational psychologists, how they defined play. And there were a number of individuals um, that had done research or had developed theories or had observed uh, behavior about play. And you can go back and you can read over a little bit people like Piaget, the French uh, educator, uh, the French uh, educational psychologist, and uh, how he defines play um, number one, it was a distraction. It was an endeavor where with whatever activity it was involved was both cognitively and play physically was integrated. And he also thought that play was a great vehicle to learn, to not only learn about the sport, but learn about your surroundings, learn about uh, and develop uh, perceptual abilities and kinesthetic abilities like balance and change of direction. So I, when I started to look at play just strictly from a football uh, soccer standpoint, then um, we, get, we get more specific, right? And we start to consider um, a lot of different other factors that are just specific to the sport of soccer. So one of my earliest um, experiences with that uh, was in being able to define all of these different factors that when combined gave us a training environment. And so it goes back to the four pillars. I remember my my C license in 1979, that was back when about the Dead Sea was sick. Uh, so, uh, and I remember that being a moment for me where like a, a switch went on where I was like, I was still pretty young, still playing a lot. And um, it was like, oh, technical, tactical, physical, psychological. Okay, these four things have a relationship. And by incorporating those four things into a, an activity, an environment, we didn't need to just have people run without a ball. And there were no decisions and there was no application of technique. Uh, we didn't need to just be able to just deal with um, technique, but not move and not think. Uh, just be able to deal with um, uh, uh, the mentality, the attitude of players, because in our sport, part of what develops mentality, competitiveness, psychological durability, uh, a sense of self, a sense of fun is competition. How do you have competition? Um, ultimately, that's close to the competition that you have in the game without opposition. So, it began to get me to ask some questions. And over time, what we do as coaches, we um, find out what our truths are. 
we we say, well, you know, I can compromise this much, but I got to have this in order. So, uh, in my opinion, economy of training, economical training, gives us a little bit of a roadmap in order to develop with our kids. Well, this is how we're going to train our kids to be soccer players, physically, technically, tactically, psychologically. And so I think it's a great, it's a great roadmap. And it is also very useful because I know that coaches at every level, at every level, one, one of the constraints that becomes more and more apparent is incredibly apparent in the high school game. And Warren will tell you, I mean, after coaching national teams and, you know, preparing players through our state program, um, coaching in club soccer, um, you, you have the same constraint there that you have in high school. You can have fields, you can have facilities, you can have equipment, you can have soccer balls, you can have goals. But the one thing that really constrains all of us, I want you to think for a minute, what the constraints are in your environment and for you as a high school coach. And it is the same constraint that is so prevalent with the national coach and with the MLS coach. And let's forget about football, soccer. It's the same constraint that you have in the NBA or the NFL um, or Major League Baseball or college sports. Now, high school sports are much more like the college game for a lot of different reasons in terms of this factor. So I'm, I'm just wondering in the chat box, what is the one constraint, the, the greatest constraint that all of you have in your environment? Can you plug it into the chat box? Interested in seeing? Mindset, Michelle, that's pretty good. It is. It, some of it's mindset. Competing interests, that's pretty good, Michael. I would agree with that. Space, time. Okay, Roman. Too many players, not enough coaches. Yep. Yep. So, and all these things start to centralize themselves uh, for, I think, the high school coach. It's um, have facilities. You have uh, a schedule that allows you to work with the players. You have equipment. You have locker rooms. You have all these things. But... Um, the two, the one thing that is very um, limiting is time. So in the high school environment, you know, your kids come in, depending on how the schedule is done actually in your school and in your school district, um, come in and it's, it's like 20 minutes of study hall, then they get changed, then you go outside, then you're dealing with uh, 50 minutes of soccer, let's say, or 50 minutes of soccer combined with um, what a couple of you mentioned, which is too many players, not enough coaches. And if it were not complicated enough, it's too many players, not enough coaches and not enough space. And that's, that's the worst scenario out of all of them, because then it's like, how do you get anything done? Sometimes your, your space, the number of players you have, the number of coaches you have, it has to get you to think about, well, how am I going to organize training? How is it going to make any sense so that when our teams get on the field, training has had an impact in the players. So one of the, one of the things, be, before we get into the specifics to that, one of the things I'd like you to consider are these three words. Um, and sometimes people use them, uh, whether they are in sport or they are in the theater or whether they are in music, 
they use these words interchangeably. And those three words are rehearsal, practice, and training. And so for a minute, what I'd like you to do is to consider what each of those three words, how you might briefly explain or define what they are. I'm interested in what you think the difference is, if there is any difference between them. And you can go ahead and uh, type it in your text box. Rehearsal, practice, training. Okay, Michelle, training you teach. Okay, Will. Roman rehearsal, just repeat, practice learning a skill, rehearsal, walking through game specific, rehearsal, mark. Okay, or lead up, lead up, individual touches, training, tactical points. Okay, so that's rehearsal, more review, practice, building of ideas, yeah. All right, so I think that's really interesting. The, I think there's a greater similarity, I believe, between rehearsal and practice and a greater distinction between rehearsal practice and training. And so you think about where the word rehearsal is utilized, um, utilized in and with um, plays, musicals, orchestras, rehearsal. So the individual parts have already pretty much been learned and they're trying to rehearse them to put them, how do they fit together? The inflections, the conductor is, conduct, he's arranging, he's, it. everybody already knows what they're doing. They're just trying to, in putting it all together, rehearse that combined effort. Practice is a little bit like that. Practice really doesn't alter any of the execution of skill or decision-making. It just reinforces what you already know. And then training, I think, I believe, is that we actually change behavior. Training is where learning takes place. So training must be an environment that prompts the player to think, behave, perform technically, tactically, physically within the context of the larger 11 aside game. Psychologically, Training, because there's competition, uh, changes players psychologically. Um, attitude, competition, uh, durability, adaptability. Um, the whole idea of training then, technically, it's not about every pass being at the same distance, but what is important for the coach to know is that I, each pass has to have the proper weight. It must have the proper accuracy. Uh, some passes have disguise. Uh, the priority of passing is the activity telling us to play the ball to feet. Is it telling us to play the ball to space? So we can just go through there and that's why training is so important is that it actually forms and changes behavior. It causes players to adapt to the environment, technically, tactically, physically, and psychologically. That's why training is so important. 
and the small pieces of it that we get, whether it's the high school environment, um, club coaches have constraints. Uh, you know, high school coaches get their kids um, five, five days a week uh, for shorter periods of time. Club coaches get their kids for only three days a week, longer periods of time. So the time factor actually probably adds up to being pretty close to being the same. Um, the imbalance and the ratio between number of games, the amount of training, well, it's probably about the same imbalance. What we do in the training environment in order to maximize it is what's important. So now that we understand that time is our enemy, time is the enemy. Um, so we have to figure out how to work more effectively within the time constraint. So uh, these are things that you, you all probably already do and have figured out because you're, as coaches, as educators, you are um, operating, you are manipulating in the environment. So between you and your assistant coach, or if it's only you, you know, before the kids get there, you're setting up an area you're organizing the bibs, you're organizing the balls, you're moving the goals, you're getting everything so that by the time the kids show up, we can more readily maximize the time. You guys are already doing all the things like that. Um, I think the, the, the more um, strident issue is that, okay, how do we eliminate things that are unnecessary in the environment so that we get to something quickly that resembles play. Because in the context of play, as I mentioned before, now you can get into application of technique. Not every pass is the same distance. Not every pass is the same surface. Not every pass is on the floor. Some can be in the air. So there's this application factor. Uh, Decision-making, it's really hard. Uh, even if you're getting technique and fitness together, technique and fitness together, there's no opposition. Um, the players can get very little insight about training that will affect their choices and the decisions that they make. I always like to use the um, example. Everybody here has got a driver's license, right? Everybody's here got a driver's license, but nobody's revoked. That's a good place to start. Um, so in having a driver's license, when, when, um, you got a driver's license, the whole experience of learning to drive, learning to drive either your mom or your dad or your older brother or older sister took you out in the car, they sat in, or the driving teacher, and they sat in the seat next to you and they took you in the parking lot. You learned how to do some basic things. Uh, there were very little distractions very little distractions there's very little going on you just had to concentrate on the car and not hitting the school building you know got to be that 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 sorted out but when you get out on the road for the first time it's like well it's not all happening in here with the wheel or the you know the turn signals and some of it's happening out there somebody's got a turn signal on i have to pay attention to it but at the same time that's happening, I'm looking at the stoplight. Is it red, green, or yellow? There are a lot of different cues. And I think soccer and the soccer brain, when it comes to choices and decision-making, there's one whole group of kids that they're, they're made for that environment. They're good. You know, they're, they can make decisions. doesn't matter if they're an extravagant player technically, but tactically they have a feeling. They have some intuitiveness for the game. Other kids are like, it's like learning how to drive. It's like, well, I have to figure out how to process all this information because in the context of all that information, uh, we as coaches are trying to get them to make good decisions, you know, that help the team. So training outside uh, of environments that have opposition or that are too one-dimensional, even with a little limited opposition, 
um, don't really translate to the game. So if we're trying to work on decision making, we have to have a context where the players have restrictions of time and space. They have opposition and we can manipulate that. We can, okay, we're going to play four versus two. Here are the ways it's set up. We're going to play five versus three. Here's the way it's set up whole nine yards. So it behooves us with the limited time that we have to find ways to get the players into activities that allow them to play that the organized the organization of the activities whether it's attacking defending or transition provides them with a framework and the game the game teaches and we can coach and teach inside the context of the game so play really is the key word in player development if we're going to train the players and make an impression on them um, in order to form how they think about the game, the decisions, how, how physically fit they are. Uh, our ideas about that have changed so dramatically over the course of 25 years where we realize now that you know, running um, outside of the context of games and activities um, it isn't all that beneficial just from a physiological standpoint unless the running that you are doing translates into the stop and go recovery oriented aspects of the game. So uh, this whole idea of play and incorporating it as the central issue um, where um, uh, players are playing, moving, applying, um, thinking, um, competing in that environment is, is the utmost of concern. That creates a certain amount of effectiveness. Well, how do we measure effectiveness? I think that's the other interesting part of all that is how do we measure effectiveness? So just out of curiosity, the coaches who are on – how do you measure the effectiveness of your players, uh, both in training and in the game? If you could type that into, it's working, okay. So effort, opportunities created, goal scoring opportunities. That's pretty good coach. Translation of decisions made in practice to the game. I would agree with that. Part of the point to learn here is that based on where your team is at and what your experiences are, everybody measures that a little bit differently. There's been a greater and greater emphasis to try and quantify some of it with some data. And so that's where the wearable technologies come in. So when, um, uh, when uh, Coach Roman talks about, is it working, the, the, the physical and psychological exertion point that you really want to see, you wanna see that manifested, we can measure some of that now with, with, um, with wearable technologies. So everybody, in working in your staffs, you know, that's, that's why being able to, while games are going on in training, uh, in, in the training environment or in your competition games, you're trying to subjectively figure out, you know, what your team needs, what your, how your team, does it exert, is it exerting itself? Some of these things are, are, are reflective of the values that you have as coaches and teachers and managers. So if this is what you want to see in the game, then a little bit, this is the way that we have to set up and training the environment to put that into the players to eventually get that out of them. So it's an economy of training, games, 
um, you'll find that, and I think we can learn some lessons too from college uh, coaches because they have a very specific environment also in college soccer. And what I find college coaches doing now is let's say, um, you know, you're playing Thursday, Sunday games, then they figure out just the same as you all have um, with your Tuesday, Friday schedule or your Wednesday, Saturday schedule, whatever the games are scheduled in your district or your part of Texas is like, okay, Sunday is our day off. Um, Monday, we, they've actually broken it down. We're like, okay, when we come in on uh, Tuesday after our Monday is our day off, or if they do take, do their recovery day on Monday, they take Tuesday off and train Wednesday, whatever that, that sequencing is, they get in, they go, okay, on um, Monday, it's competition. All we do is we get our kids to get out and in the games and activities, we just build competitiveness. That I don't care what the soccer looks like right now. I don't care what the decisions are like, but the games and activities, we're going to get these people to compete. That the, the next day, all right, now we're going to train on the things that we need to do better from last week's game, <clears throat> excuse me. And the next day, the college coach is like, all right, now we're going to replicate what the opponent does. And we are going to train against that attacking, defending transition. They also have, just like we do as high school, high school coaches and managers, they have, um, you know, video at their disposal. So how do we cut up a little bit of video to enhance the learning by players that adds to the value of what we're doing in training. But it all comes back to games and activities, but that cycle that college coaches have evolved, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, at least we have a built-in day off in high school, Sunday. Now they are playing club, perhaps. And if they are, here's another layer of complexity. But, it also means that when we're training in games and activities, um, rather than trying to get our fitness by grinding people and doing just strict running, um, at least you're learning while you're running and the running and fitness translates to the game. So that's an important factor, I feel like. Um, that's a lot of things that run together. And some of it, I'm sure that high school coaches already have learned to manage some of that. So I'm just kind of curious, what specific kinds of questions do all of you have about constructing either game environment and training, how to, if there are specific areas, because sometimes sometimes those specificities lead, you know, somebody else is thinking that also guys and gals, somebody else is thinking about, well, this is what I have trouble. How do you train that in the game? So what are the areas in particular that you all are thinking about in terms of in training? Recovery day. It's an, it's an important aspect now, Michelle, because we know that aside from the physical recovery, the number of games that kids play um, in a short period of time, um, sometimes, you know, we have to manage as play as coaches. It's, you have to decide when, you know, against lesser opposition or, Maybe because of injury, you have to take your better players off the field. But in terms of recovery, it's not only the physical recovery. I find also it's the psychological recovery. I find that the worst, the worst time to actually train uh, in general is the time where most of us as high school coaches and teachers train, which is in the afternoon. The kids have already been in six hours or six and a half hours of class and they come out and they are just varying degrees of fried or varying degrees of fatigued. Uh, 
And I've also noticed that through the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I can tell when certain kids, you know, like it's Wednesday, this, this, I bet these three boys are not going to be very good today because this is the third day they've been cooped up. So recovery activities, I think psychologically. So I still do this uh, one activity uh, because I like the way it physically um, gets their blood flowing. Uh, I like that I can control the, I like that I can control the amount of space uh, so I can create the amount of exertion that I want. And I also think it's a lot of fun. So um, uh, if you can imagine two teams in a 35 by 35 or maybe a little less, two teams of eight. So um, one team has two balls in their hands. One team has two balls amongst the eight players and they can pass and move the ball by throwing. The other team of eight has one ball, but it is at their feet and they are playing. So we used to call it uh, with the national teams, two up, one down. The team with two up can pass the ball and catch it because while the team of eight with the ball at their feet is moving and playing with the ball, the, two, the team with two balls, they're trying to hit the ball on the floor. And it's great. It's, it's engaging um, psychologically. It's engaging because at the end of the day, um, we are captivated with the toy on the field, which is the ball. And I can control the space and I can make it a little bit competition. You know, if I want it to be exerting because the exertion, the loads in soccer are stopping going. So if we just played a game, the game had a lot of exertion in it physically and psychologically, then I might make the area a little bit smaller. So two up, one down. Um, that's one aspect. The other aspect, I think you can do things that are outside the context of soccer, Michelle, and you can do things like get them in a pool and mobility um, as well as range of motion activities. Plus in a pool, the water redistributes your weight and you don't have gravity pulling and pushing on you and you're stopping and going, um, which is the thing that is the tear down. It's not running over long distances at one pace that tears players down. It's the 12 yards turn, decelerate 12 yards the other way, turn 40 yards that way. Okay, now I get a little bit where there's some recovery, right? And that's the teardown of it. So by putting them in a pool and um, actually doing range of motion exercises, uh, lightens the load of uh, weight bearing. Um, uh, the temperature of the water has, even if it's a little bit warm, that's fine. But if it's a little bit cool, uh, it's, it's not as drastic as putting them into an ice bath, but it does have some effect in cooling the body temperature down, which in, in some ways also um, stimulates blood flow to certain areas and uh, ice on the whole, cold temperature on the whole has an effect that is pretty remarkable on the body. So from a recovery standpoint, um, the, the competition part of it, like the two balls up, one ball down game, I keep score. So the team with the ball down on the floor, work, uh, somebody in the team is counting passes. And if I can, I typically use a different color ball for the one on Right? I could use a different color ball to use on the floor. And if I can, different color balls for up in the hand. The reason for that is that 
think about how much visual cue there is in the game. I mean, it's, it's when we're driving down the road, somebody doesn't open their window and go, hey, I'm gonna stop at this stop sign. No, we watch them stop. Their brake lights come on, their turn signal comes on. So now by using different color balls, two up, one down, you create some visual cueing. You can actually ask the kids, you can use it for teaching visual cueing in your recovery games. And as we're playing with the ball on the ground, where are the two balls that are moving to try and smack our ball? Because we can't just be um, captivated by the one ball on the ground that the, that the team is moving with their feet. This is exactly what happens in a soccer game. It's not only the ball, it's the environment. It's, so the recovery part of it is we are also teaching through games and activities and recovery, um, cueing in the game, decision-making in the game, Decision making usually doesn't in games and activities, whether they're recovery or um, games that you're using in training, usually learning is a cumulative effect. And then we have an aha. Okay, you can see it come on with the kid. Oh, so maybe it's in a recovery game that they really kind of get it. So does that make sense? Does that answer your question, ma'am? Excellent. Excellent. What other questions or interests do any of the other coaches have in terms of play being the central issue and games then being a big, a big central issue in, in the training and the development of players? And as you're typing, I might, I might add this. We generally, when we're talking about this, we, we can distinguish between two different um, levels of games. So I think that games, whether it's four versus two, five versus three, two V two flying changes onto goals, um, all of which have the components of games, time, space, restriction, opposition, um, they are small games. They are general principles of play. General principles of play. But more and more, because our kids at 14, 15, and 16, they have to play in the 11 aside game. So, how does not only this translate to that, but how do we now construct games of larger numbers, bigger spaces? that are functional. So when I say the word functional, um, and I'll, Roman, I'm going to get to your question in, uh, in a second. Uh, we, can you discuss the value of inputs technique versus static? Yeah. So that's a good, that's a good question too, Warren. So just to end my thought versus just small games, principles of play, attacking, defending transition, and now, okay, we put the back four with the shape of our midfield, three or four or five, whatever it is, and two thirds of the field. And here's what we're trying to teach. So functional aspects, role, responsibility, back line, center backs, full backs, center midfielders, six, eight, 10, whatever it is. So how do we now not only train in small games, principles of play, big games, functional aspects? of how we see our teams kind of playing. So Warren's uh, question is about the value of inputs on the development of technique. Big difference between technique and skill. And this is what I think it boils down to coaches. Technique, the mechanics. So when we talk about passing the ball inside of the foot, toe up, heel down, pushing through the ball. We talk about the mechanics of receiving get in the line of flight of the ball, receiving surface. Um, take, the, take the steam off of the ball. 
so that your first touch gets out in front of you. When your first touch gets out in front of you, your head comes up. These are all mechanical principles of receiving and passing. Dribbling, inside and the outside of the foot, change the direction of the ball. Sole of the foot grips the ball against the ground. The, the skill development happens when there's opposition because then the tools of technique have to become functional. They have to become useful. And now you can ask questions like, well, inside and outside of the foot for dribbling changes the direction of the ball. What is the purpose of dribbling? Dribbling is to uh, penetrate, to get into the space behind or between defenders. Well, how you use the inside and outside of the foot, well, that's, you know, I might do it different than than uh, Mark and, and Mark may do it different than Carlos and that, that, and not everybody may be good at it versus passing, you know, passing. I would say, well, these, this group of kids here, they're, they're pretty good in the game at just connecting between 15 or maybe 20 yards. But when we ask them to play from here, 35 yards away, they can't hit a ball that far. So how do we ultimately um, um, functionally in the 11 aside game, how do we then teach them how to do that? Well, we have to have games. We can put out the cones and say, okay, hit a ball from here to there. Here's how you prepare it. Hit a moving ball. Here's the surface. Uh, we're trying to drive balls along the ground versus flighting balls in the air but eventually for this to become practical it has to happen in the game so we have to think about well how do we now put together a game where the players can play between two boxes where the players can play over a bigger space maybe it's a multiple goal game rather than just one goal where everything gets so centered it gets so compact how do we play um, uh, to try and get into two goals or three goals? So now we get longer balls in the game. They have to find application in the game. So I think that's the difference between here, one line here, one line there, hit a ball. Um, we can spend a little bit of introductory time in that, but I think it's very, very difficult. It's hard to develop in that environment that is kind of static and kind of one dimensional. And then all of a sudden you expect players to just perform that in a game of 11 aside in your district. I think that's a big jump. So we have to have training games that kind of reflect that. And Roman's question about at what point is there too much play? Um, um, purpose is what you're trying to describe there. I, uh, and I, I love the idea that um, we are trying to figure out what is purposeful because purpose defines everything for us. So we can get different things out of games. Uh, we can use the same game and by manipulating it, the space, maybe some of the uh, numbers up, numbers even, numbers down is the space longer than it is wider? Is it a square? And then the conditions in the game, what we're trying to do. So we can use um, games to teach and emphasize different things. You can use the same game and by tweaking it a little bit, changing the uh, conditions a little bit, changing the spacing a little bit, you know, it's... Um, you're going to get more fitness than you are worried about decision-making. I knew as a college player, uh, I knew, uh, I'll give you this example. My college coach, um, I knew it was going to be a bad day. I knew it was not going to be a great day when we were going to play three versus three plus one in a half of a field for 90 seconds. Two touches. And it was, it was all about, he was charting how many passes completed by each team, how many touches by each player 
he had a couple of assistants, a graduate assistants. They're like, okay, but the what we got to because we were trying to get the number of a you know, better, a greater number of passes. We learned how to play over short and long distances. We were exerting ourselves, and it was always just about really psychological um, learning those things, but psychological toughness and fitness, exerting ourselves. He wanted us to exert ourselves. So he put us in an environment where the consequences were always going to be about the losers. If you didn't want to exert yourself there and you lost because we had to be competitive on the field, then at the end of the day, we would do more running. We got, we had a nice little hill at the University of Northern Colorado and we became acquainted with that hill on and from time to time. So that's what he wanted to get out of that environment. So I, I think the whole purpose of it, you could play three versus three plus one and play it in a 20 by 20 and manipulate the constraints a couple of different ways and get more possession and thinking out of it and playing because you're always playing a man up and attack. You could play an end zone game. You could, you could fashion a dozen different games, but you're going to get more soccer out of it and decision-making versus three versus three and one half of the field. And here's what I'm checking off the box. You got 90 seconds to get after it. Here we go. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. So one, one of the things we can control is the conditions that, we create for soccer, technically, tactically, physically, and psychologically to be learned in. And the mechanics of just technique, if we want technique, the mechanics, to somehow translate the skill, even if kids look uncomfortable, even if they're a little bit of fish out of water, I think you have to have them in games because ultimately, they're not going to get any better uh, without opposition or restrictions of time and space. And the, the example that I used before about driving a car. So instead of going out with your driving teacher or your older brother or your mom or dad and learning how to drive in the parking lot, learning how to drive, just take the steering wheel off of the car. I'll give you the steering wheel. Now, uh, I want you to go into the living room and while you're watching TV, you can go ahead and practice driving the car. Well, that would be silly, wouldn't it? Because there's no brake, there's no gas, there's no turn signal, there's no cars that you have to watch, there's no stop signs, stop lights, people in and out of yield lanes. But you could hold the, the car uh, wheel and pretend like you're driving. That, it's not going to translate to driving the car, is it really? And the more static the environments get, then sometimes we give kids the steering wheel, but we don't give them the rest of the car in the environment. Does that make sense? That's, that to me is, is one of the big differences in the development of all aspects of, the, of, play, of players, technically, tactically, physically, psychologically. Other questions? Thanks, Warren. Hey, I'll tell you what, we got this pause. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pull it up into the uh, chat right now, the link for the webinar resources that we've had from day one. Okay. As well as the um, sign up page for those that, that wanna join in and have the weekly invite uh, we'll put those up as well uh, and i'll go and do that while any you have any other questions and i'm going to uh put in my email into the chat if that's okay warren oh that's awesome yes sir yeah and i'm also going to put in oh you my, did it privately to me what's that you did it privately to me did i really yes sir I'm a dummy. Uh, hang on a second, I'm just typing. Okay, so here I can, no, that's save chat. 
Uh, oh, I see. I see. There it is. There it is. There it is. All panelists, all panelists and attendees. All right. Now I might, now I might be able to figure some things out. That's my website. Uh, and then I'm going to also put in my Gmail if I can ever um, help anybody with anything or be a resource for any of you um, for what you're doing with your high school teams or with your clubs and the good stuff that you're doing. Uh, I know right now, too, it's kind of wacky. Um, everybody just uh, talking with uh, Carlos prior to everybody else getting on, just learning about what's going on in different parts of Texas right now with school, the COVID. And it, it's not we you know i know everybody would feel a lot better about things if they just got back to normal and we just all got back to the kids going to school the some certainty nobody worrying about safety so it's going to eventually it's going to come around so we just have to kind of hang in there for now and as educators and coaches just adjust a little bit and hopefully be patient you know is there are there any other questions at all that I can help anybody out with or I got a question coach yeah um, I think what when you think you know when you get a team especially with us in high school here you know you're going to get new teams and, and new players are going to come and go all that sort of thing yeah how how do you you know how do you find it or how do you come up with a way to say I'm going to play this formation now I've got I've got the players to play this way I've got the players to play, you know, this other way. How do you come up with a formation that you're going to want? You know, or do you, do you focus yeah. on just one? Do you have a couple in mind? Um, that's, a, that's a real, that, that, that last part, Carlos, is what really makes the question interesting. Um, I think one of the, the see, hot college coaches, they don't always get their way. I don't care if they're in the power five or they're in NAI school, they're trying to recruit kids that fit in at high school. We have the dynamic where it's like freshmen in seniors out. Well, I'm not sure I have the, the, the pieces here. Um, technically, tactically, physically, and psychologically to play that way in that arrangement. I would just always go back to the organization of the players on the field has to uh, result in a couple of things. We have to be able to create goal scoring. We have to be able to stymie the other team from scoring goals, and we must be able to deal with the game in transition. So those three things must happen uh, in the game transition from attacking to defending transition from defending to attacking. So our, our challenge is um, we may not be able to line our kids up in the same formation from year to year. The principles of play are the same. So one year you may play with a back four and four straight across midfield. You may play in two, a block of eight with two strikers. Other years, you may play in a block of eight, but the strikers are inverted. One is higher than the other. Uh, trends in the game. I mean, we become fascinated. Well, because Manchester United or um, women's national team is playing in a 4-2-3-1, we're going to play in a 4-2-3-1. So there's a little bit of that going on every once in a while. Um, so I think finding an arrangement for your players that will allow you to score goals and defend is the, it's, it's the biggest thing that you do for your, for your kids in the 11 aside game. Uh, the part of the question that is really intriguing to me, Carlos is, well, we either have to, I think, I believe, we either have to train our teams to do one of two things. Whatever our arrangement of the players are, we have to then be able to play 
two different ways in that arrangement. This is the way we normally play. But how about goal up or goal down related to time? So some coaches are like, we always play three, five, two. The center of midfield is one back and two up. But when we're playing a goal, a goal um, down, we play with one player back in the center of midfield and two up versus when we play with um, uh, trying to defend a little more for a goal up, it's two back and one up. So we, we play different ways in the same system. Um, when we play um, uh, a goal down and we want to press higher up the field than our outside fullback midfielders, we go and we play against their outside midfielders or outside backs. Now, if we want to hunker down, then we play five across the back, our three backs plus our two fullbacks, three central midfielders, and we, 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 we dig the trench, we throw the dirt in front, and we add the sandbags. So that's playing two different ways, basically in the same arrangement versus some coaches that I've worked with are like, okay, we normally play um, four, three, three, but when we're a goal down against time, we're always, our goal down formation is three, five, two. And that's the way we then, you know, we train and we prepare our teams as best as we can is, you know, four, three, three, the game is um, three, one, there's 20 minutes left. Okay. We're going to change to three, five, and two. Now, do we do that at halftime? Do we do that with 20 minutes left? How we prepare our kids, how adaptable our players are and our teams um, that, that has something to do with it. How do we prepare our teams to do that? But I think that's what it, what it boils down to Carlos do you, okay, do we, do we play two different ways based on time and score with, within a system, within an arrangement? Or do we say, oh, you know, we typically play 4-3-3, three, three, but if we're two goals down, 20 minutes left to go, we're going to go play 3-5-2. Here's the way we arrange our players. Here's the way that we press in and play in their half of the field. And this is the way we try and get two goals back. Does that make sense, folks? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And whether, whether they're MLS coaches or whether they're college coaches, they're trying to prepare for those inevitabilities and those contingencies. And so as coaches, one of the things we do as coaches and as educators, I don't care what level you're working at, we go, how are we going to figure this out? Well, uh, it has to make sense to the players. It can not only make sense to the coach and to the manager. And in doing so, we're going to play two different ways in a system. And that's what we're going to train versus, you know what, when we're goal down, we're going to go play uh, three, five, two, or we're going to go play two, four, four when we're goal down, because it doesn't matter anyway, whether we lose by one or we lose by two, we're going to yep. go get a goal back, you know, or, you know what, we're up by two. I think one of the hardest things we do in our arrangements and our preparations with players is to try and get our kids to sit in because generally all coaches will say, most coaches will say the same thing. Um, you know, when I get my kids to sit deeper, we don't really defend. We don't really exert ourselves and we're too doggone close to our goal. And depending on what the qualities of our, if the goalkeeper is the best player on the team, that might also work goalkeeper and the center backs versus you know what we're pretty athletic let's get a further away from our goal so that things cannot happen of a random nature and uh so it, all all coaches at every level are trying to figure these things out and at the high school level because the teams change from um year to year freshmen in seniors out also, the grading periods, what I'm learning, because uh, I haven't done a lot of coaching in secondary education, what I'm learning is 
the grading periods, the nine weeks in kids that might become el ineligible or become eligible from being ineligible, that's a factor in how you also uh, train and prepare your team. So you guys are dealing with uh, secondary coaches are dealing with a lot of dynamics that are very, very unique in their environment, I believe. All right, let me break in right quick. I'm, I'm going to kind of shut the, the video portion of this down and we'll keep the, the chat open. This is, I appreciate you coming on this morning. Everybody here this morning, it was a great group. I, it was a great day of learning. I appreciate you, Dave, and the, the time you took out of your, your schedule to be with us and help us out. I learned a lot today. This was, this was very, very good. And just speaking from, from myself and, and hopefully the group, thank you so much for your time and doing this. Well, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Um, I'll always, uh, always say to coaches that, you know, one of the things that's inspirational is whether we're in virtual environments or we're at the United Soccer Coaches Convention or we're at the TASCO workshop or to see the um, number of coaches and the enthusiasm and the interest, youth coaches, high school coaches, college coaches, pro coaches, national coaches, to see that level of enthusiasm and interest is pretty inspirational. So I want to thank all of you for taking some time out of your schedule today. Uh, as I said, I put my email and my website in there. If I can ever help any of you out with anything, um, please reach out. And I want to wish all of you the best of luck as you're working towards getting your teams uh, prepared to start playing uh, in later December. Thank you very much. It was really hot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you, much. Coach. Thank you.